I finished making the changes to the 22 and right now I have what I believe to be the perfect 22. Or it's going to be the perfect 22 momentarily because I have just a couple of more things to do before it's ready. But before we get this wrapped up, I want to talk about the changes I made so far and why I made them. And most importantly, what I learned because all of that is what makes this the perfect 22. I changed the factory trigger out. I added sling studs front and back to the stock for sling. And I changed the scope from what was on here. And on the trigger, the trigger that was on here, and, and I'm not fussy about triggers. I can get used to just about any trigger. But the trigger that was on here, the pull weight of the trigger was actually more than the weight of the rifle. And I'd never thought about this before. But the percentage of the pull weight of the trigger compared to the rifle, I, I think is pretty important. I, I've had heavier triggers than this, but they weren't a problem. I didn't mind them, but they were on heavier rifles. And it makes sense that, you know, if the trigger pull weight's heavier than the rifle, that that could cause some issues. And I've talked before about um, heavy rifles just being able, easier to shoot accurately. All right, and lighter rifle ones are more difficult to shoot accurately because with a heavy rifle, the weight makes it want to just sit there, gravity, and it's less affected by external forces such as, you know, a bad trigger pull on your part or, or even your breathing or pulse for that matter if you really want to be precise. If the trigger though is so heavy that it requires more than what the rifle weighs, that's a lot of force acting on light weight. So that, that made sense for me. And another thing with the factory trigger, it was way too back, way too far back or too close to the pistol grip. All right, so it just, it became uncomfortable. And I, I tried shooting just my fingers, not really gripping the rifle just to get my hand further back. And that really didn't work on this one because of what I said about the pull weight of the trigger. You can imagine how having a really heavy trigger and then not gripping the rifle would just pull the entire rifle, especially if the pull weight's more than the rifle itself. So that for me, it's worth it changing the trigger there. And I'm hoping it's going to make a big difference today. For the sling studs, all right, I added sling studs. This rifle's light enough that, that I didn't have to have a sling. But when I'm going into the field, I really want a sling on my rifle. If you walk enough miles, eventually it just feels good to sling the rifle on your back and not have to carry it. Not to mention in rough terrain, a lot of times you just need both hands. So I got that done and on the scope, this came with a four by 16 by 42 Tasco, an old vintage Tasco. And it was a good scope, but it was a good target scope. I wanted a three by nine on here just for out in the field. And this is a three by nine rim fire scope. And by going with this scope, I'll be able to get some more rings later on that are even lower, get the scope even lower, and then that's going to give me a better cheek weld, and that's going to help me shoot more accurately in the field or here at the range. All right, now to finish this up, we need to shoot a group just to see what kind of groups we're getting. Then we need to set zero, and finally, for this to be a dependable rifle for me out in the field, I need to know the trajectory of the bullet. So we're going to check the trajectory and we're going to do it the old fashioned way with targets. Now let's see if we're on paper and what kind of groups we're going to get.
That new trigger made a difference. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to finish this video here at the shop. While I was filming, a, a lot of other people showed up, and I don't film when other people are at the range. And these were new shooters, and they were really nice, but there's too much going on when other people are there. So just from a safety standpoint, I don't want to be trying to film and concentrating on that while there's other people that I, I need to keep an eye on and pay attention to them. So, and that was Joey you saw in the background earlier today, and I don't have to worry about Joey, but with other people, I just don't film. Again, safety reasons. Right, but from there, you saw that last group, which I was happy with that group, but that was at 35 yards. So I moved the target from there to 75 yards to zero this rifle and fired a very similar group, which I was extremely ecstatic with also. And after that, groups opened up a little bit, the wind had picked up, that's just part of it. But I got it zeroed and I zeroed it at 75 yards. And then I took the, the target, set it at 100 yards, checked my trajectory and I was getting about a three and a quarter inch drop at 100 yards moved it back to 35 yards and I was hitting inch and three quarters high. So I, I know what the trajectory of my bullet is. And I would have liked to have fired a shot at 50 yards. Just, I believe 50 yards is probably gonna be the apex of the trajectory there, but I'll verify that later. But either way, I'm, I'm pretty good. I, I can hit a squirrel out to 75 yards no problem and just a little hold over at 100 and I'm still gonna hit him so we're in good shape and when I say wanting to know where the apex is if it's at 50 which I, I suspect is right around that I'm just really wanting to fine-tune because usually when I'm squirrel hunting I like to go for headshots I don't want to tear up any more meat than I have to so I'm really being particular right now so what that amounts to but at this point, I am ecstatic with this 22. It's shooting great. But that's not what makes this the perfect 22. Or at least the perfect 22 for me for small game. What makes this the perfect 22 for small game for me is the things y'all didn't see when I was changing triggers. Okay, I had to do some fitting to the stock in order to make the new trigger work. And I wasn't paying attention for a moment there. I put a little too much pressure on the wrong spot and my stock split. So the other day when I was mentioning that the stock was in the house with some wood glue drying and clamps on it, that's why. It, it was an easy fix. I fixed it, but still it's you know, a mistake on my part. I went into this project though knowing something like that can happen. Anytime you start, you know, fooling with especially an older rifle, with these old wooden stocks, things like that do happen. So this particular rifle, and I knew when I bought it that I was going to change, probably change the trigger. Um, I thought I might be able to get used to that factory trigger on this one. I wasn't sure, but. No, that one was pretty rough. I hear stories all the time about how horrible triggers is. And then, you know, I try a particular rifle with a, you know, I've heard how horrible the trigger is and I don't mind it at all. But in this instance, it really was tough. And that goes back to the, you know, the trigger pull weight being, a, you know, what percentage of the weight of the rifle it is. But I went into this one knowing I was probably going to do that and what was going to be required and, that things can go wrong when you're doing that. So I had a plan B, which was a plan B, C, and D for that matter. Okay, with this particular rifle, Remington 581, I can buy a factory stock, used factory stock, just like this one off of eBay for not very much money. If I'm patient, I might run across a factory stock for a, a 541, which is the same action and barrel, just a different stock. So a 
a 541 stock would fit on here no problem. Which those are those are really nice stocks. They're walnut, whereas this one's not. Um, I don't even know what wood this one is. <laughs> Probably birch, beet, something like that. But all right. And I could have ordered a Boyd stock, a brand new stock for this rifle. So I went into this knowing, hey, if I mess something up on the stock doing the fitting or something, I can fix it. No problem. And this rifle, it wasn't that expensive. Okay, I, I could have paid more money and got a rifle with a better trigger that wouldn't have needed any of that. And I probably would have saved money because that trigger was pretty expensive. At the same time, I, I could have paid a little less and, and got a less expensive 22. This still would have done everything I needed to do. And then I really would have saved some money. But the problem with either one of those approaches is I wouldn't have learned anything. And I learned some stuff on this one. That's why this was the perfect one for me, because I learned some stuff. And the things I learned on this one, they apply to all my firearms. This, a lot of people think, oh, it's just a 22. And it is. But again, the, they're all you know, as far as rifles, the same principles apply to all of them. So the learning that about the, or beginning to understand the trigger pull weight as a percentage of the weight of the rifle and how big a deal that is, and I, I really do think that's a big deal. I might, you know, I'm definitely gonna think a lot more on that one in the future. That's, it's an interesting concept. I wouldn't have learned that you know, if I hadn't got this one with the trigger it had and changed triggers and so forth. Okay, the the splitting the stock. That that's something I knew could happen easily. I just got careless. Okay, and it, and it's fixed. It's not an issue. It's repaired. But again, I got careless, and that was a, a really good quick you know reminder there. So another lesson learned. Don't get careless with wood. It can split if you're not paying attention to what you're doing. All right. So I learned some things on this rifle. And that's what makes it the perfect rifle for me. And it wasn't so expensive that I didn't have to worry about messing something up either. You know, a really nice antique rifle of any sorts. I don't want to go grinding on those. I, um, you know, my skill set's not there yet to do repairs on something that, something really special. All right. But this is how I get my skill set to that point, though. Fooling with these that, you know, if I make a mistake, it's okay, and then I learn something. That's how I improve my skill set. And again, that, that applies to all my firearms. You know, they're all wooden stocks. They're, you know, same principles for all of them. So this, this was a great project for me, and I learned a lot from it. Now, with the trajectory on this one, the way it's set up, I, this one's ready to go into the field. And the groups I shot, there are a lot of 22s that could have done that. All right, I, I was proud of this one. I was proud of, you know, the way it performed out there and so forth. I really was. There, there's a lot of 22s that could do that. But there just aren't a lot of them that I, I would have learned anything from. So that's why for me this is the perfect 22. And you know, as I was out there and thinking and so forth, I, again, a lot of us think, oh, it's just a 22. Here in the future with our ammo shortage, I don't really see that changing anytime soon. A 22 just might become, you know, the most valuable rifle you own before this is over. All right. As far as, you know, actually being able to get a few rounds to go to the range. And I'm not seeing any 22 rounds on the shelf right now either. But most of us have a couple of boxes of 22s put back and occasionally you're going to run across a, a couple of boxes of 22s that you can get. Well, they're inexpensive, and you're getting 50 or 100 rounds per box. 
You're not getting that with center fires. <laughs> and you're not going to be wanting to be at the range blasting away with center fires when you do find some. So the old 22, that, that might be what we practice with in the future. You know, we're, nobody knows how this is going to play out on the ammo. But, you know, it's looking iffy for, for the foreseeable future. So if you're wanting some quality time at the range, and I needed that, that trigger time. I hadn't shot in a while. That was, that was really good for me to, even with a 22, just to get that practice in. All right, if you're wanting that quality time at the range in the future, you know, it might be with a 22. Well, I hope you enjoyed our time at the range today. And for those of you that are just joining the channel, this right here is part of a larger project I'm working on right now, which is my four gun hunting set for 2021. I'm putting together a set of working guns for hunting that'll cover whatever I need, a shotgun, a 22, and two center fire rifles. And, and the first one I wanted to work on was the 22 because it's squirrel season right now and I want to get some small game hunting in. And that's specifically what this is for and the niche it's going to fill within my four gun set. All right. So next week, the next rifle I'm going to work on, I, I think right now just due to availability of stuff and so forth is probably going to be the Winchester Westerner in 270. All right. I'm probably going to set it up and so forth. And again, it's just availability of things and just the logistics. So we're probably going to start on it as the next project rifle. And this coming weekend, I really want to get some squirrel hunting in. So I have no idea, you know, we're going to be squirrel hunting next or working on a 270. <laughs> but either way, you know, if you want to find out, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Hey, you'll see which one we go with. And if you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. You know, let YouTube know you enjoy hunting and shooting videos. I think that about covered everything on the 22. God bless and have a good day.